Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore live stream. It's great to be uh, back with you uh, today. Uh, today, you probably have uh, remembered is Mother's Day. At least I hope you have remembered. If you haven't, then uh, maybe you're in trouble uh, for that. But just thought at the beginning of the live stream, it would just be good to take a moment just to acknowledge that. And uh, one of the things we learn in the Bible is that God is both male and female. And uh, there's various references in the Bible in terms of God fathering us. Um, but also there's some verses uh, that talk about uh, kind of the mother heart of God as well. And uh, it's great to recognise the input of uh, mothers uh, into the world, uh, but also into our lives. So we just want to take a moment really just to celebrate uh, every uh, mother that's watching this and also celebrate the contribution of every mother into our lives. Uh, obviously, we've all had physical mothers, uh, but also we have probably had spiritual mothers or people that have significantly invested into our lives, as well as occasions like this sometimes can be uh, moments of pain as well, because uh, maybe we're grieving the loss of a mother. Maybe we're uh, grieving the loss of, of maybe a relationship that wasn't quite how we would want it to be. Anyway, I thought it'd be good to take a moment uh, just to be able to pray uh, this morning and, uh, and acknowledge all of that really into our lives today. Lord, I thank you that uh, uh, you reveal yourself uh, in scripture as a, as a parent and as a great uh, parent. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that we're so grateful for the impact of parents into our lives. And today we want to celebrate uh, the impact of every mother uh, into our lives. We want to celebrate mothers uh, around this uh, country. We want to celebrate every mother uh, tuning in today. And we want to pray that they will know that they're celebrated and know that they're loved. And we want to thank you for every positive contribution that we've had in our lives from our physical mothers, uh, but also from spiritual mothers as well. And uh, Lord, if uh, today does stir a lot of emotions uh, that maybe makes it a difficult day, Lord, we just want to take a moment to bring you into the midst of all of those emotions. And today we're looking at you being a God who heals. And Lord, I pray that you will release your healing into any grief or sorrow that we may be carrying today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're continuing our series called The Spirit Speaks. Uh, as you'll know, if you're a regular uh, viewer of this, uh, we this year have had a real sense that God is wanting to do something fresh in our midst uh, through the working of his spirit. That's why we started off looking at Ezekiel 37. And uh, part of that is uh, dry bones being brought back to life because God breathes on them. And you'll know uh, the same word that's used in scripture for breath is the same word that's used for spirit. And so God pours out his spirit and he gives new life to dead bones. And uh, continuing with that theme, we've been looking at different gifts of the Spirit and different ways that God's Spirit, that God's breath works in our lives. And today we're going to talk about one of the gifts of the Spirit, which is the gift of healing. I'm going to read a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul lists the different gifts or some of the different gifts of the Spirit. And he says this starting at verse 7. He says, now to each one the manifestation or the working of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, God's Spirit is poured out into us in order to be able to bless others. And he goes on and says, to one that's given uh, through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. And then the list continues and talks about prophecy, talks about tongues that we were looking at last week, talks about the interpretation of tongues. And then in verse 11 says, all these are the work of the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time this morning just thinking about the gift of healing. And it's interesting because the words that are used uh, uh, by Paul, the literal Greek words that he used, are plural. Um, so it's not so much gift of healing, it's actually gifts of healings. And I think that's quite interesting because um, what Paul is saying is there's a multitude of gifts of healing. And I think that is uh, representing the, a number of things, really. One, it's representing there's loads of sicknesses and diseases that need healing. And so there's a, you would expect a multiplicity of gifts to bring healing to every different form of sickness. Um, also, I, th I think, and something we'll talk about a little bit this morning as well, not all sickness 
is, is uh, physical. And sometimes we can carry kind of inner pain and uh, inner hurt and kind of an inner sickness. Uh, sometimes we can uh, carry mental sickness. Uh, and so there's very different forms of uh, sickness. And I think that's maybe why when Paul writes about the gift of healing, he makes it plural because there are gifts of healing. And actually, for every instance of sickness, we need to receive God's supernatural gift of healing. And the good news when you read through the Bible is when God sends Jesus, and we know that Jesus is the fullness of God in a person. So if you want to know what God is like, look at the life of Jesus, because God poured all that he is into flesh and blood and into a man, the man Jesus. And then how he lived on life uh, on earth was to show us uh, what God is like. And what we discover when we look at the uh, life of Jesus is there's more healing miracles that he performed than any other miracle. So uh, between the four gospels, there's actually 37 recorded miracles that Jesus performed. And 30 out of those 37 miracles are healing miracles, where people were either set free from uh, some oppression or were supernaturally healed of some physical ailment. So the other seven miracles were uh, miracles to do with creation. So like the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, where Jesus multiplied supplied bread, there's the calming of the storm. So there's, there's uh, different uh, miracles that involve nature, but 30 out of 37 of the miracles that Jesus performs are healing miracles. One of the things I think that says to us right at the very beginning is God loves to heal. So if you're sick today or you feel like you're carrying sickness of any form in your body, know that God would love to meet with you and release the gift of healing to bring change and transformation into your life. And we know that because we see it in the work of Jesus and in the life of Jesus. Now, Mark's gospel is actually the shortest of all the gospels, but interestingly enough, it has the greatest number of healing miracles in it. So if you want to read about Jesus and how he healed people, Mark's gospel is a great place to start. And what I want to do today is I want to read my favourite healing story of uh, Jesus from Mark's gospel. And it's actually the first uh, detailed story of Jesus encountering a sick person and bringing healing to them. And I'm going to read the story. It's only five verses long. It's not very long. But I'm going to draw some points out that I think uh, help us understand how Jesus heals and wants to bring healing. And of course, we we live in a, we know we live in a very broken world. And so maybe it's no surprise that into a broken world, that through all that brokenness, there's so much pain and suffering that so many people have to endure, that we all have to endure in one form or another. Um, it's such uh, good news that God comes as the God who heals into that situation. So we're going to read from Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 40 through to 45. And it's when Jesus heals a leper. It says this, it says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So it's, it's a really simple story, but actually it's a really powerful story. And it may only be five verses, but I think there's a real depth of, uh, of understanding that we can find about the heart of God from it. First thing I want to say is that leprosy, um, it, the word that we, it, that we translate as leprosy from the Greek is actually a wider term than just for leprosy. And actually the Greek word uh, really um, is a catch-all word for any skin disease. So although it says a man with leprosy came to Jesus, actually what we can be confident of is that it was a man with a skin disease that came to Jesus. And uh, if you uh, uh, know uh, God's laws around uh, leprosy and skin disease, you'll 
know, in the Old Testament, when God was creating a new people and a new community of the nation of Israel, if someone presented with a skin disease or with leprosy, they, were, they had to leave their home and they had to leave their community and they had to live outside the camp of the nation of Israel. Now, you think that seems quite a stern thing to do for someone who uh, just so happens to have caught leprosy or some other contagious illness. But actually, when we think about it, in, this is the days before uh, physical medicine, this is the days before qualified uh, doctors and hospitals, Actually, the risk was that someone was carrying something that was contagious that actually could have a massive impact, if not potentially obliterate all of God's people. And so the reason they would put them out of their camp and put them out of the community and make them live on their own in what became lepers' colonies, the reason they would do that was for the sake of safety. So it's not like uh, people were being punished for being ill. It's just that the greater good meant that they needed to be quarantined. But obviously the impact of that was people not just ended up suffering from a physical ailment, but then they, on top of that, suffered the the pain of separation and exclusion and what would have felt like um, uh, rejection from their family, from their community, from their home. So there was a huge amount of loss for anybody presenting with a skin disease um, like this leper in Mark chapter 1. And actually, uh, under the uh, God's law, they were viewed as unclean. They were viewed as unclean, not because God was punishing them, as I say, but because God wanted his people to keep them at a distance. And because God's people were all about being holy and being pure and being presentable to God, then he said, you need to treat them as being unclean, which means you need to keep your distance from them for the sake of your own health. And so uh, people uh, that had uh, leprosy or other skin diseases, if they saw someone coming towards them that was healthy, they'd have to cry out and say, unclean, unclean. And it was a word of warning. It was a word that, uh, it, it, it was a cry that would say, keep away, you're at risk because I'm carrying something that could cause you issues. So you see, when this guy comes to Jesus, he's actually, number one, taking a huge risk because he shouldn't have approached him. We see in uh, verse 40, it says he came to Jesus and he begged on his knees. And Jesus was a rabbi, so he was a holy man. So this guy was breaking all convention to come close to Jesus, which maybe is a sign of the desperation that he's carrying in his heart. It's it's his uh, depth of longing to be set free that he takes a risk and actually comes near to Jesus as opposed to shouting out unclean, unclean. But it's really interesting what this guy says to Jesus because his, his, his uh, question or his statement is he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And what's interesting about this statement is the man doesn't doubt that Jesus could heal him. He doubts whether Jesus would heal him. And I think quite often we end up in a trap when we're not well of feeling like nobody cares and maybe God doesn't care. And you feel like the impact of this guy's journey of being ostracized by his community has actually not just uh, meant that he's carrying a physical ailment, but it feels like something's been ripped on the inside. And actually, he's not sure that anybody really cares. And because he's not sure that anyone really cares, he's lost his certainty that even God cares. And what's so beautiful about this passage is the way that Jesus responds to this. And as I said earlier, for some of us, we carry the outer sicknesses. You know, maybe we've got a pain in our body or we're uh, physically uh, carrying some sort of illness. But for other ones of us, it's maybe the treatment by other people, the words that have been spoken over us, the sorrows and the disappointments that we've carried, but they've left us crumbling inside. And you see, when we unpack this miracle, what we're finding is a guy who doesn't just physically get healed, but actually some of the inner stuff, some of the pains and the loss that he's carrying in his heart also gets healed. And what is so beautiful is the way that Jesus responds. And I'm reading from the New International Version, and in verse 41, it says, Jesus was indignant 
by which it doesn't mean Jesus was angry at the man. The word that's translated for indignant, indignant elsewhere in the Gospels is actually translated for um, Jesus felt compassion. It's the same word that Jesus, uh, it says of Jesus when he looks at the crowd and uh, sees they've got no food. And so he takes the five lo uh, loaves and two fishes and multiplies them and feeds the 5,000. It, it's, it's a longing to do something about it. And actually the Greek word means, means like a stirring in the very guts of you. So it's like Jesus' uh, innermost being, the depths of who he is were stirred to say this isn't right and something needs to change. I think that's really powerful just to reflect on. You know, God, when he looks at the state of this world, something stirs in his heart and says, this isn't right. And you know, sometimes we put on the news and we read some of the horrors, we read some of the mistreatment, we read about some of the inequality, we read about some of the exclusion that happens today. And maybe sometimes on the basis of race, sometimes on the basis of gender, sometimes uh, economically. Um, God looks at that and something within him gets stirred. And sometimes, you know, we feel a sense of anger, a sense of injustice about it because we're picking up and we're reflecting the heart of God. And Jesus, he feels compassion. He feels a stirring in the very depths of who he is. And then he does what nobody in Jewish culture and no rabbi and no Pharisee would have dared to do. He reaches out and touches the guy. And all the way through the Old Testament, it tells you if you come into contact with anyone who's unclean, if you're in close proximity to anyone who's unclean, you need to run away because if they touch you, their uncleanness will make you unclean. And Jesus was so carrying the love and compassion of God. He broke the conventions of the day. And Jesus was so confident in who he was as God on earth. He was so confident in the healing power of God. He knew that he could touch something that was unclean. And rather than be, become unclean because of it, the cleansing power that he was carrying, the healing that he was carrying, would cross the divide and bring transformation into this guy's life. Life. Isn't that amazing? Whatever pain you're carrying this morning, however deep your heartbreak, however extreme your illness, know that the compassion of God means he wants to cross the divide. He wants to cross the barrier. He wants to touch you and say, I love you and I'm with you. And remember, this guy starts off with this question, which is, I, if you are willing, will you? heal me if you are willing. So his question is, will you? I know you can, but actually, uh, will you? And Jesus's answer is, I am willing. I think that is so beautiful and so lovely that Jesus wants to cross every divide, every word of exclusion, and he wants to say, you are welcome, you are included, you are loved. I don't matter, it doesn't matter what society has done to you, it doesn't matter what your history speaks to you. I'm reaching over the divide, I'm touching you, and I'm saying, I am for you, I love you, and I am willing. And you see, when Jesus touches this guy, he broke the sense of isolation, rejection, and exclusion, as well as then, as we will see, physically healing him today. And I think that's so beautiful. You see, Jesus wants to bring wholeness into our lives. The Greek word for salvation actually means wholeness, and, and it's a word for completion. And so when we invite Jesus into our lives, what we're asking for is not just for our history to be forgiven, although that is an amazing thing that is a, is a transforming work of the cross. Uh, actually, what Jesus is offering is more than that. He's offering wholeness and complete restoration. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows in order that we could experience an exchange, in order that we could experience the things that have limited us, restricted us, held us back, held us down, the judgments, the words of other people, in, in order that Jesus can reach across it all and break its power and bring transformation and healing. 
And can you imagine, we don't know how long this guy had, uh, had leprosy or this uh, disease. We don't know how many years he'd been separate from family. We don't know how long it had been since he felt the touch of another human being. And God himself reaches out and puts his arm, his hand on the guy's arm. And instantly the compassion of God, the heart of God, embraces the guy and brings transformation. Can you imagine Jesus putting his hand on him? The guy said, are you willing? Jesus puts his hand on him and he says, I am willing. What an amazing act of love. What an amazing act of inclusion. What an amazing act of grace. And not just breaking the isolation, the rejection, the inner pain, but Jesus brings healing to him. Verse uh, 42, immediately, it's one of Mark's favourite words, immediately, leprosy left him and he was cleansed. The beauty of the gifts of healing that Paul offers us that are the outworking of a life lived in his spirit is that we can expect as God moves in us and through us, we can expect God's compassion to come and bring healing and restoration. And of course, if you want to grow in effectiveness in terms of ministering healing to other people, one of the keys it seems to be from reading the Gospels is compassion. In the story of the Good Samaritan, one of the famous stories that Jesus tells, uh, but uh, in that story we have um, a uh, priest who uh, sees someone in need and he's too busy, so he goes over on the other side of the road. We have an Israelite, a, a member of God's community, coming home from worshipping at the temple, cross over the road, they're too busy, they don't care enough. And then we get the Good Samaritan, and it says that the Good Samaritan felt compassion. And Jesus uses that story really to say, we need to have compassion. And actually, if you want to grow in God using you to bring healing into others, whether that's physical healing, whether that's emotional healing, then the thing to ask God for is, God, give me grace. God, give me compassion. God, help me to be stirred with the things that stir you. God, help me to be indignant to see somebody suffering. God, help me to uh, uh, not just sit idly by, but to do something. And you see, when we carry the heart of Jesus, then we can expect to see the power of Jesus start to flow through us. But if we don't carry the heart of Jesus, how can we expect the power of Jesus still to flow through us? So just a simple tip, really, if you want to grow in terms of uh, your experience of seeing God use you in healing, ask God to grow your love for other people, your compassion for other people, a compassion that's willing to reach out and touch. Maybe those people that no one else is willing to spend time with or offer words of hope to or words of encouragement to. You know, one of the most powerful things sometimes we can do to bring healing to people is to be right there alongside them and to speak words of love, just like Jesus says to this guy, I am willing, be cleansed or be healed. And then we find the end of the story, Jesus says to the guy, don't tell anyone about this, um, but go and present yourself to the priest. The reason why Jesus says go and present yourself to the priest is because the way that somebody was able to rejoin a community once they had been healed and the infection had gone was because they would go and present themselves to a priest and a priest would examine them and say, oh, the skin disease is gone, the leprosy is gone. You can come back into the community. You're now viewed as clean. So Jesus was saying to him, now I want you to go to the priest because my heart for you is not only that you are physically clean, but that actually you were brought back into the family to which you belong. That's why it's so important that we um, don't do life on our own. I know sometimes when we're watching uh, live streams and things, it, it's, uh, we're doing it in our own home and we are doing it on our own. But we know that God wants us to be part of a church community. You know, we know that God wants us to be a part of a family. And for this guy, it wasn't just enough. Jesus wasn't just happy for him to be physically healed. He wanted his, his, the fullness, the wholeness of salvation that Jesus wanted to bring into his life was to reintroduce him back into family, back into community, because that's the place where we uh, receive the outworking of God's love. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're watching this and you're not well connected into church, 
connect yourself into church, send us an email, info at restorecc.org.uk or ian.king at restorecc.org.uk and we'll connect you into a congregation, we'll connect you into a small group, we'll connect you into a place where you can feel that you belong and you're known and you're loved. Jesus' heart for this man was full integration, full restoration, inner and outer. He also said to the guy, don't say anything to anyone. Um, and uh, maybe not surprising, really, uh, the guy, his whole life had been transformed in a moment. The guy couldn't help but tell other people. And we kind of think, well, why didn't Jesus say, you know, just go and tell everyone? Because that would be the quickest way for everyone to learn about Jesus. And we actually learn that from the uh, last verse in this passage. We find that the problem with this guy going and telling everyone is the crowds search for Jesus which means Jesus isn't free to go the places where God is leading him to go or to do some of the things that God wants him to do because of the power of the crowd. And uh, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it? Sometimes it's the cry of the crowd and the demand of the crowd that pulls against the thing that God wants to do in our lives. And sometimes to go deeper with God and to please God, we actually need to turn our backs on the crowd so that we can tune into what God says rather than what the crowd says. Maybe there's something about that, a lesson for that for contemporary culture, that rather than just do what uh, the crowd of our culture would do, actually we want to separate ourselves from that so we can hear what God's doing. And Jesus, it says, he, he went to a lonely place. That's the same word that's used for wilderness, which is the place that Jesus goes to be able to tune in uh, again to the voice of his Father. Maybe if you want to grow in a healing ministry, maybe that's one of the keys for you to let go of some stuff so that you can better hear the voice of God and uh, better therefore flow uh, in the spirit of God. But, um, it, we learn in the Bible there's a battle between the work of the spirit in our lives and the work of the flesh, which can be the work of the culture and the crowd that surrounds us. And so sometimes we need to let go of one so we can embrace the other. And uh, for Jesus, he's restricted because this guy tells other people. So it's not like Jesus doesn't want the good news spreading. It's just that he's concerned that he wants to be able to do the things that God has called him to and not be pushed off course by the crowd. Maybe you're watching this this morning and maybe actually if you were honest and realistic about your life right now, the truth is you've been pushed off course by the call of the crowd and the pull of the culture. And maybe this morning Jesus is wanting to call you back and said, you need to let go of that to come back to follow me because I've got more for you. I've got something better for you. I've got life in all its fullness for you. But coming back to our main point, this is a beautiful story of Jesus interacting with an individual and responding with exactly what the individual needs. Right the way through uh, all the different gospel stories, we'll find out that Jesus interacts with people differently. He treats them differently because we're all unique. And uh, our roots, our pathway to healing, the, uh, the specific gift of healing we need will be different according to our context and who we are. And Jesus takes the time to make what is general specific. And in a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray that Jesus would come and touch us and release healing and that we would know that we are uniquely loved by our Heavenly Father, just like this guy discovered, and therefore can know the fullness of life and transformation he wants to do in our lives. Mark ends his gospel saying um, that uh, when he commissions his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, he says that we will lay hands on sick people and they will be healed. And so a church operating in a way that honours Jesus will be a church that has faith and an expectancy that God will flow through us to bring healing to others. So we're gonna pray, we're gonna pray for healing right now. Lord God, I thank you. This is an amazing story that displays your heart. And uh, thank you that healing for this uh, guy came actually really simply and really gently. But thank you, Jesus, you knew, Lord, not just the physical healing he needed, but you knew the inner heart healing that he needed. And Lord, in these moments, we just want to offer our hearts up to you. And we want to offer our bodies up to you. And maybe for us this morning, Lord, there's a number of us and we need heart healing, Maybe there's a number of us and we need physical healing. And maybe there's a number of us and we need both. 
Lord, I thank you that you're the God who is willing and who is able. And so right now, Lord, whatever the uh, specific issue that we need healing for right now is, Lord, we want to invite you to come. And just as you, in compassion, reached out your hand and touched this man and everything changed, we pray right now the gifts of healing might be released into every physical body, into every heart, into every mind, into every situation. We release right now the supernatural gifts of healing in Jesus' name. And if there's a particular part of your body that you're asking God for healing with, if it's appropriate where you are right now, it might be good just to put your hand on that part of your body. And Lord, we command and we release supernatural gifts of healing to make these bodies new and restored. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things you'll discover, uh, certainly from my own uh, life journey, uh, but also from some stories in the Bible, some, some healings happen instantaneously, some of them happen over time. And so this morning you might have felt God touch uh, your body or your heart, and uh, you might know that something shifted. Hallelujah, praise God, email us, let us know. Let's enjoy uh, these moments. Uh, maybe you didn't feel anything physical, and that doesn't mean God hasn't done it. Sometimes God does it and we don't even know it, and it's only the next time that... Uh, that we go and see a doctor or whatever, that, uh, that we become aware that something shifted. But sometimes we just have to keep asking God to heal and keep asking God to heal and keep asking God to heal and uh, healing gets released over time. So I would just encourage you, if you've uh, asked God to heal you this morning, if you've invited God's healing presence, keep doing it over the coming days. Keep inviting God's spirit to work and release the gifts of healings that you need. And, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, some of the impact of the salvation, deliverance, freedom, wholeness that Jesus has for you. Thank you for joining with us today. It's been great to be with you and we'll see you again soon. Have a great week and God bless you.